Perfect. Um, so I want to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, and again, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. I'll introduce myself. I'm Danny Zaki. I work with the San Francisco Bay chapter of Sierra Club. I work on all things Bay, shoreline and water related. Uh, and this is the first webinar that we're going to be putting on monthly um, about educational topics relating to the Bay and water issues. If you're interested in learning more about those, just let me know in the chat uh, and I can go ahead and add you to that list. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce Peter Dreckmeyer tonight, the policy director for the Tuolumne River Trust, um, who will be presenting for about 30, 35 minutes. Um, and after that, we will have a Q&A portion. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll pass it over to you, Peter. Thanks, Danny. And uh, good to see some friends on the Zoom and hope to make some new friends. And uh, we have some distinguished guests who I hope will introduce themselves at the end. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in and share some photos. <clears throat> okay, assuming everyone can see okay. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to provide a lot of information, but I don't expect you to remember all of it. Um, bottom line is that we could have a vibrant economy and a much healthier Tuolumne River and Bay Delta. And so that's uh, going to be the gist of my presentation. Uh, this is the <clears throat> Tuolumne River. And you see it starts in Yosemite National Park. It drains the northern half. The Merced River drains the southern half. And the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is in Yosemite. That's owned and operated by the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And it generates hydropower as it supplies water to 2.7 million people in the Bay Area. Uh, you'll see another large, much larger reservoir, Don Pedro, which is owned and operated by the Modesto and Turlock Irrigation Districts. And that water is primarily used for irrigation, 200,000 acres of prime farmland in Stanislaus County. And then you see the Tuolumne continues through the city of Modesto. It joins with the San Joaquin River. They flow together up into the Delta and the Bay. That's the journey. And these are the communities in the Bay Area that get water from the Tuolumne River via Hetch Hetchy. So San Francisco is a third of the customers and two thirds are in San Mateo, Santa Clara and Alameda counties. And there are 26 water agencies in those, what we call wholesale customer uh, counties um, that are <clears throat> work together through an organization called the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency or BOSCA in negotiations with San Francisco and the state and others. So the Tuolumne starts high in the Sierra, uh, Mount Lyle, 13,000 feet above sea level. And as snow melts or rain comes down, um, the river forms a little bit upstream of Tuolumne Meadows. The name Tuolumne starts there. And it flows through Tuolumne Meadows, through the Grand Canyon of the Tuolumne, which is a fabulous backpacking trip if you're looking for one. And then it fills the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. And <clears throat> downstream, this is a, one of the more common native species, rainbow trout. Um, rainbow trout are really interesting in that they can live their whole life in fresh water and reproduce. But if they have access to the ocean, they'll make a long journey. Uh, they will get really big on all the food in the ocean and they'll come back to spawn in their native river. The, uh, this stretch of the Tuolumne upstream of Don Pedro uh, does not have steelhead because they can't get over the dam. And of course, fish are really important to many other species. One of my favorites is the river otter. We also have world-class rafting in this stretch of the Tuolumne. Uh, class four, very exciting. You probably want a, an experienced guide great trip, trip to do. There are some wonderful swimming holes, waterfalls, good fishing. So for all these reasons, the Upper Tuolumne was designated a wild and scenic river in 1984. And our organization was founded in 1981 at a time when more dams were planned for that stretch of the river. So the campaign focused on federal wild and scenic status, and it was a huge accomplishment. Uh, we got that done. So <clears throat> the Upper Tuolumne is protected. 
Uh, again, this is Don Pedro Dam, owned and operated by the Modesto and Turlock Irrigation Districts. And it separates the upper Tuolumne from the lower Tuolumne. And a lot of what we're going to focus on tonight is the lower Tuolumne River. And Don Pedro Dam is going through relicensing, so it needs a, a federal license. Got its first license in 1966, 50-year license. Uh, it was supposed to be relicensed by 2016, but we've, they've fallen behind a little bit. And this is an opportunity to catch up with some of the great environmental laws, especially those in the early 70s, like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. And one of the reasons why this process has been slow is that the National Marine Fisheries Service, other agencies and NGOs suggest that as part of the process, we should look at fish passage, getting anadromous fish that live in the freshwater and saltwater um, from the lower Tuolumne to the upper Tuolumne, which was their historic habitat. And the irrigation district said, well, Don Pedro Dam doesn't block the fish. Our other dam two miles downstream, LaGrange, is the, the terminus of the, of the salmon run, and it's never required a license. Well, we made a case. Um, FERC said, yes, it requires a license as well. The irrigation districts went to the Court of Appeals, and we won that one. And so the licensing for LaGrange had to catch up with the, the license for Don Pedro, and we're still in the thick of all of that. So you see the lower Tuolumne is very different than the whitewater in the upper Tuolumne. It's passing through the Central Valley, uh, but it's really beautiful, especially the area downstream of the, of the dams. And this is where we still have salmon. So like steelhead, salmon start their life in the freshwater. They make their way out to the ocean. Uh, they'll live there for about two and a half years. And when it's time to spawn, they come back to the freshwater and lay their eggs, and then they die. And all those nutrients from the, the ocean really fuel the food web. Many, many creatures depend on salmon. And so you can see there's, there's a lot of nutrients, marine derived nutrients that make their way up into the Tuolumne thanks to the salmon. And many species depend on, on the salmon. So uh, a female will lay about 5,000 eggs and perhaps two will survive to be reproducing adults. So most of the eggs get eaten, most of the baby fish eat, get eaten, and most of the adult fish get eaten. So really important for the, for the ecosystem. So the challenge is that humans take four out of every five gallons from the Tuolumne. So in an average year, the unimpaired flow or the natural flow is only 21% reaching the San Joaquin. Now the the biggest culprit is agriculture. Like with the breakdown in the state of the developed water or the water that people take out of the river, about 80% is used for agriculture and about 20% for urban, uh, mostly in the Bay Area. But what we've seen is the Tuolumne Salmon Run is worse off than any other Central Valley River. The state has, and the federal government have a goal of doubling the average salmon runs from 1967 to 1991. And for the Tuolumne, that would be 38,000 fish per year. Last year, we had 186. So the situation is very, very bad. So the San Joaquin River, after accepting water from the Merced, from the Tuolumne and the Stanislaus, joins the Delta. And the Bay Delta is also extremely stressed. And that is why the State Water Board is in the process of updating the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. So this was uh, required by the Clean Water Act. It was first adopted in 1978. It's supposed to be reviewed every three years. The last time it was actually updated was 1995. So a long time ago. And for the last 13 years, we've been working to update it for modern times. So the Delta, it's the largest estuary on the West Coast of the Americas. It's where the fresh water and salt water mix, really critical habitat. And half of the precipitation that falls on, on California drains out through the Delta. It's uh, 
habitat for more than 500 species of fish and wildlife. It's a major stopover for the Pacific Flyway. It's the migration corridor for anadromous fish like salmon and steelhead, sturgeon. But it's changed a lot starting back around the, the gold rush when a lot of the, the delta was diked, levees were built to create farmland. So what used to be floodplain habitat uh, became farmland. And then upstream, we had all of these diversions for both agriculture and urban needs. So now only about half of the natural freshwater makes it to the, the Bay Delta. And in dry years, it's about a third. So upstream, what is the importance of flows? Well, obviously fish need water to move around. And what's critically important is that there's enough water to flush out the baby fish in the spring. Um, they, there are a lot of predators there that wanna eat them. And the faster they get moved out, the better off they do. Temperature, really, really important. The native species have evolved in cold, fast-moving rivers. Um, they're now being outcompeted by non-native species that evolved in slow-moving warm water. So at certain temperatures, fish can't reproduce or they'll get diseases and die. This is a photo from the Klamath River, um, I think about 2006, when a lot of water was diverted for agriculture at exactly the wrong time and the water got too warm and 70,000 fish perished. Floodplains are really important and you need enough flow to get that water up on the banks. So this is where the juvenile fish will rear if they have access to it. There's a lot more food there and there's protection from the predators that would be in the main channel. So if you have floodplains, the, the smolt, which are the baby fish that are just getting ready to go out to the ocean, can grow twice as big. And again, they have a much better uh, opportunity to survive. So as I mentioned, we've altered the ecosystem and plants like water hyacinth from South America thrive, especially in dry, warm years. You'll see mats of this water hyacinth for mile upon mile. And then beneath that, you have bass, which again are warm water fish that can survive in the Tuolumne because the water is so warm and they prey on the baby native fish. You've probably heard about the toxic algae blooms in the Delta. So slow moving, warm, nutrient rich water uh, provides <clears throat> the right habitat for these neurotoxins, blue green algae, and they can kill pets and wildlife and make, make people sick. And a lot of this, the communities in the Delta are um, lower income communities, communities of color. So it's a real environmental justice issue that the SFPUC uh, doesn't seem to acknowledge. And then the lack of freshwater flow into the bay changes the salinity balance, which affects everything from plankton at the base of the food web, all the way up to orcas that depend on salmon out in the ocean. And humans depend on salmon. We still have a, a commercial salmon fishery in the Bay Area, but it did have to be closed for two years in 2008, 2009, because there just weren't enough fish. And every year um, there's a big debate about whether we, how much fishing can take place and there are cuts and we've lost a lot of those fishing jobs already. So in December, 2018, the State Water Board uh, finally deliberated on phase one of the Bay Delta Plan, which looks at the San Joaquin Basin. So the Stanislaus River, Tuolumne River, Merced, and Lower San Joaquin. Phase two looks at the Sacramento Basin. And it took a lot of work, but we got them to adopt higher flows. And instead of just base flows, minimum flows, um, it's now a percentage of unimpaired flow. So in wet years, there would be more water because it's a percentage of a lot of water. In drier years, it would be less water. And the percentage it starts at 40%. So humans would still get three out of six gallons, but we leave two, uh, three out of five, but we, we'd leave two out of five between the months of February and June. And again, those are the critical months for the baby fish. And if you don't have 
baby fish surviving, you don't have adult fish returning. So immediately the uh, irrigation districts in the San Joaquin Valley sued the state water board. And despite all of our efforts, the San Francisco PUC joined them as well. And one of the reasons might be that San Francisco has gotten pushed around a little bit by the irrigation districts because San Francisco has junior water rights. They, they got their uh, rights to the Hetch Hetchy system in 1913, whereas the irrigation districts were the first in California back in 1867. So the, um, <clears throat> you see that from this one agreement that San Francisco agreed to support the district's position on fish flows. So they're contractually obligated to follow the lead of the irrigation districts that have done a very poor job of stewarding the Tuolumne River. So what we did is we created a water supply calculator where we could put in different inputs for demand, rationing, um, <clears throat> new water supplies, et cetera. And we looked at the worst drought on record, which was 87 to 92. And we looked at current demand at the time, 198 million gallons per day. And this is for the, all the 2.7 million people in the Bay Area. Uh, we didn't consider any rationing. And what we found is at the end of a repeat of that six year drought with the Bay Delta plan flows in place, we still have water in storage. So this looks really promising. Any other water agency would be thrilled to have water rights like this. But the SFPUC said, well, you know, your information's correct, but we're looking at a much more severe drought. We call it the design drought. So what we do is we assume that there's a drought on the horizon that's as bad as the six-year drought of record, and it's followed by the driest two-year period on record, 76, 77. And we're planning for demand to reach 265 million gallons per day. So 265 is one of those magic numbers that'll come up um, over and over again. So this is their what their planning scenario. And you see it's much more conservative than any other major water uh, use water agency. And the reason it's a problem is because if you're planning for such a severe drought um, to get through it, you have to really bump up the rationing. So right out of the gate, San Francisco was saying, that if the Bay Delta plan is implemented, it was adopted, but it's not implemented yet. So it's just on the books. Uh, that rationing would be 50%, something that we've disagreed with and I think we've debunked, but they still use that number. So what has changed since the design drought was developed? It, it was developed after the 87 and 92 drought when San Francisco did get close to running out of water. Um, but demand going into that drought was 290 million gallons of water per day. And it's been under 200 million gallons per day for the last eight years. So why, why would that be? We'll get to that in a minute. Another thing that San Francisco did that was really a smart idea was instead of just generating as much hydropower as they could to make money off of the electricity, they prioritized water supply. So uh, hydropower comes second. To, to water. And that's, you know, basically that alone ensures us that at the end of a six year drought, as bad as 87 to 92, we're going to have probably a year and a half more water than we did at the time. And just recently, at the end of last year, San Francisco re released um, a study called the Long Term Vulnerability Assessment that looked at climate change. And they looked at 100 years of known data. They looked at 1,100 years of tree ring data. And they did 25,000 model runs based on simulated historical data to try to figure out what we might expect from climate change. And if that's something that we need to worry about a lot or not so much. So back to why um, demand, one of the reasons demand has gone down so much, in 2008, the SFPUC approved something called the Water System Improvement Program. So this is a big package of capital improvement projects, replacing dams, pipes, water treatment facilities, 80 of these projects. And at a cost of $4.8 billion, 
plus debt service that we're going to be paying for many, many years to come. And embedded in this proposal was uh, the idea of getting permission to divert another 25 million gallons of water per day from the Tuolumne. And we said, no way, Tuolumne is already way overworked. We support the seismic upgrades, but we will oppose you on taking more water. So at the time, they had projected that by 2018, demand would reach 285 million gallons per day, MGD for short. But the new general manager, Ed Harrington, who recently served on the commission, good guy, he reached a compromise with us that they would cap water sales at 265 MGD until 2018 and then revisit it. And we were willing to um, agree to that. So there were no lawsuits and the plan went forward. And what happened is people started paying, paying more for water. So even before the drought, we were down to 223. And during the drought, we were down to 175, remarkable. Less, we were using less water overall than back in 1976 and 77, despite all the population growth. And in 2018, when they had projected 285, we were at 196. So their projections were off by 31%. And this is something we've seen over and over again. And we're trying to get them to be more honest about demand projections. And an interesting thing happened during the, the big drought in the mid-teens, um, four or five years, that our water use declined in San Francisco and San Mateo counties by 23%, but jobs grew by 27%. So also their whole socioeconomic analysis that said, oh my God, you know, rationing is gonna tank the economy. It did just the opposite. The economy thrived while we were using a lot less water. So San Francisco has uh, two sets of demand projections. Uh, one is for their water supply side. And these are the numbers from something called an urban water management plan. So every five years, water agencies have to update these plans. And part of it is to look, look ahead and project what demand is gonna be in 25 years. And you see here that they project 236. Now for a long time, they used 265 as demand, and they tried to get away with doing that this time, but we caught them. We had to do some investigative work and use our water supply calculator backwards and force them to change. So they're projecting 236 in their urban water management plan, but that's what they have acknowledged as an outside envelope, and it's based on uh, plan Bay Area. So this is a roadmap for growth in the Bay Area. It's uh, a requirement, and ABAG and MTC oversee this. And you see that um, the plan is to add a million more jobs by 2050. And we already have a serious housing deficit. So we're expecting more residents and we got to catch up on the housing. So they're looking at two and a half million more Bay Area residents. Uh, so this is a tremendous amount of growth. And in San Francisco alone, they're projecting that we're going to add twice as many people in the next 15 years as we did in the last 15 years, which I think is very unlikely, in part because communities don't like a lot of growth. And I live in Palo Alto, and I know people are, uh, it's almost a little bit too far in the, in the anti-growth. But um, we did this survey of San Francisco voters in 2018. And we found that 85 of the people who had an opinion on Plan Bay Area, once they heard those numbers, 85% felt it would reduce their quality of life. So a lot of times politicians aren't necessarily representing the values of their constituents. So the other set of projections comes from the finance team at the SFPUC. And they really have to be more accurate because if they over project water sales, over project demand, there's gonna, they're gonna face a deficit. And that's really problematic for them. So they put a lot more thought into it. We, um, we finally got the uh, commissioners to say, hey, staff, we'd like to see a comparison of these water supply projections and the finance projections and compare them to the actual. And, it was something I was able to produce in a couple of days, but it took them six months because they were hoping the re request would go away. We kept reminding them that uh, they needed to follow through. 
And this is essentially what it showed. These dashed lines here are the urban water management plans. So that's supply side. And you see they're way above what the actual was. So they're all projecting demand's gonna keep going up when demand actually went down. And these uh, dotted lines here are the finance projections. They don't go back as far. So there's only a couple of them. So both over projected, but water supply by a whole lot and uh, financed by a little. And basically what they admitted is that the, um, the, those demands in the urban water management plan are the outside envelope. If everything gets developed that's on the books, so Plan Bay area, that's what demand would be. And with the Finance Bureau, they try to make it as close to actual as they can. But they always use the, the water enterprise, water supply figures. So, and this goes way back. You can see these are um, demand projections starting back in 73. And uh, they were projecting that demand would reach 450 million gallons per day. So I superimposed what the actuals were and you can see we're less than 200. So they got it off by a lot. And, but the thing is they were planning for demand to be much higher. So the SFPUC system depends a lot on storage, on reservoirs. So they've got their, their reservoirs on the Tuolumne. They have something called a water bank at Don Pedro Reservoir that functions as water supply. And then they have their Bay Area reservoirs. So um, total storage, about 1.4 million acre feet. And there are a lot of different um, units that we use. You hear me talk about million gallons per day, that's for demand. When you talk about storage, it's 1,000 acre feet. And if, imagine an acre foot being a football field a foot deep in water. So um, 1,458,000 ,000 acre feet. And then when we talk about flows in the river, we talk about cubic feet per second. So my apologies that there are a lot of different numbers, but again, the thing you need to remember is that San Francisco is in really good shape and we can afford to leave more water in the Tuolumne River. This is how their water rights work. <clears throat> so the Raker Act gave them the rights to build the Hetch Hetchy system. The Raker Act acknowledged that the irrigation dis districts had senior water rights. So of the runoff coming down the river, the first 2,400 CFS, so cubic foot per second, think of a basketball, the first 2,400 belong to the irrigation districts. And then between mid-April and mid-June, the cutoff is 4,000. And later on, that'll be important to remember. So the gray here is what the irrigation districts were entitled to in these years during the drought in the teens. And the green is what SFPUC was entitled to. And what you see here is that in dry years, San Francisco has poor water rights, but they have all that storage. When their storage is full, they have enough water to last more than six years. And they always try to have it full. And when it's not full, they kind of get paranoid. And it's almost like, you know, you're, you're driving across the, the country and every time your gas tank gets down to 80%, you got to rush and go fill it up. It's really um, irrational. In these big water years, they're entitled to a whole lot more water. For example, in 2017, San Francisco was entitled to enough water to last 13 years. So they could have filled all of their empty reservoirs twice had they been empty, but they weren't. Um, this is an average year here in 2016. And in an average year, the SFPUC is entitled to three times as much water as they need. So if this coming year is average, all of their reservoirs are gonna fill up. The state's still gonna be in drought. We're gonna hear about you know, problems in other parts of the state, but San Francisco is gonna be at full storage. This is the storage on September 12th. Uh, you see here 983,000 acre feet. Um, current demand is about 210,000 acre feet. So if you do the calculations, there's enough water and storage to last more than four years right now. This shows what happened to storage on the Tuolumne back in the, the last big drought. And this doesn't include the Bay Area storage. So things were even rosier. But you can see that 
they are able to keep Hetch Hetchy pretty full and their other bigger reservoir, Cherry, fairly full. What happens is the, the water bank, which is basically credit for water on paper, uh, that decreased. And then as we started entering 2016, you see it starting to shoot up. And so at, at the, the height of that last drought, there was enough water to last more than three years. So I mentioned the, um, the survey we did, we found tremendous support for the environment, um, San Francisco Bay and the Tuolumne, also good support for affordable housing, a little less so for market rate housing and not much support for more office space. We also found that uh, protecting the environment was a major motivator for people to conserve water. And I'm sure people on this call conserve water all the time because we want to protect the environment. And the truth is, it usually doesn't benefit the environment because all that water that we conserved during the 2012 to 2015 drought was just held behind dams. Um, they were only releasing the minimum flows that they had to. And so this is what the river looked like. The blue is what the river got. The gray is what people took. And what you see is for five years between 2012 and 2015, the unimpaired flow averaged just 12%. And then so much water came down in 2017 that they had to release it as fast as they could. The river was flowing at the maximum allowed by the flood rules from early January into the summer. So all that water we conserved basically got dumped in one year when it didn't provide any benefit. And what the Bay Delta plan would do is they would spread out that benefit. So you'd have 40% in those five years, and then 2017 would be 44% instead of 79, because they still would have had to spill water, just not all at once. And you see this pattern repeats over and over again, 21 to, I mean, sorry, 2001 to 2004, river is starved, then they have to dump water for two years. Uh, starts up again. So that's the problem with the way the Tuolumne is managed. And the key is you, you, you spread this water out, maybe you capture some in groundwater for availability during dry years, and we can have a healthy river without running out of water. So obviously for San Francisco that considers itself a green city, it's pretty embarrassing that they're one of the worst stewards of the river that they manage. So they claim they have a better solution where they can produce more fish with less water called a voluntary agreement. And you might've seen in the news that it's rearing its head again. Uh, the last one died out, but they don't give up. Um, one of the reasons the last one died out is that the National Marine Fisheries Service commissioned a peer review that found fatal flaws in the fish models. So these are fish models produced by the irrigation districts. They basically hire consultants to come up with the rosy picture that they'd like to see. And then they say, look, we've got a better solution and we don't need to leave more water in the river. <clears throat> That's as much as I'll say about the volunteer agreements, but they're gonna be in the news a lot lately. And um, we invite you to join us in uh, looking at them and commenting and trying to prevent them from supplanting the Bay Delta plan, because that's the whole goal here is to replace the Bay Delta plan, unimpaired flows with a checklist of things that won't work. So just finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the climate change study, because everybody asks, what about climate change? You know, don't we have to prepare for the worst? And certainly we want to prepare for things to change. And things are going to change differently in different parts of the state. Um, for for the Tuolumne River, because the SFPUC's reservoirs are very high up in the Sierra, um, we're actually not expecting to see a change in mean annual precipitation. We're certainly going to have drier stretches and wetter stretches, uh, but on average, uh, the, the water supply, the precipitation isn't expected to change much. And this isn't my study. These are experts from... Uh, universities and think tanks, et cetera. So what we realized was that the, the, the study didn't answer the questions that the commissioners would have. What we want the commissioners to do is shorten the design drop by one year and to use 
real demand projections and to consider some of the benefits of climate change to towards San Francisco's water rights. Um, so we asked them to produce runs using actual current demand and including the Bay Delta plan. Let's see how climate change might impact uh, those situations. We asked for the return period, which is uh, the likelihood of a drought occurring for the design drought. You know, if it's if it's a prudent thing, you know, the study should say, yeah, it could happen. You know, we need to plan for it. And again, we we asked them to look at earlier runoff, which I'll touch in a minute. So, the um, the demand at the time was 195 mgd, and they looked at six different uh, demands. Um, the, the most common one baseline was 16% uh, higher than current demand. And the other one they used a lot was 23% higher. So you can't just look at a graph and say, this is the real situation. Um, <clears throat> but we did, you know, so here we could basically see, okay, if demand were 23% higher than it is today, um, this is what a repeat of the historical droughts would look like. And you see, this is the six year drought, 87 to 92. And we, we used 800,000 acre feet of storage, okay, 800. So we put in the design drought, 1300 acre feet of storage. And you can see it's much more severe than anything we witnessed in the last hundred years. And so we could use these numbers. There are, there are little clues in the document and information we've gotten through Public Records Act requests that enable us to use the information to make our case that the design drought is way too conservative. For example, you know they've done these 25,000 model runs, 1,100 years of tree ring data, et cetera. And they mapped out all of those droughts and the worst one used about 1,150,000 acre feet of storage. We know that the design drought would use 1,300 acre feet. So it's an outlier. Nothing ever came close, even these model runs looking into the future. So they had to, uh, return periods for the known droughts in the, in the long term vulnerability assessment. Through a Public Records Act request, we discovered that they had a number for the design drought, but mysteriously it didn't appear. And they said, well, it was just, you know, there was too much uncertainty. But they did have this um, graph in there. And basically what it shows is the bottom is deficit or storage used. And the y-axis is return period. And you see it's logarithmic, so 10, 100,000, 10,000. And they had the three recent known droughts in here. And so you can, we know that precipitation isn't expected to change much. So, for example, using the 87 to 92 year drought, you go up and see where it crosses the black line. And it's about 420 years, once every 420 years, which is what they had in, the, in their um, document. So what we did is we added the design drought because we know how much storage it would use. And we found that the return period was 70,000 years. And then we took a year off of the design drought because that's what we've been advocating for. And it's uh, once in 10,000 years. Now these aren't firm numbers. Basically we do these exercises to say, it's like, hey, this graph makes it look like these are the right numbers. Um, if they aren't the right numbers, what are they? And we get ignored. And the, and the commissioners allow staff to get away with just ignoring really good questions based on a lot of research and number crunching, in part because the San Francisco PUC commissioners are not elected. They don't have to answer to the voters. So they allow staff to say what they want to say, and they don't make any changes. Very frustrating. So logarithmic is kind of hard to visualize. So we made it linear, and you see... Uh, the known droughts under a thousand year return period, you've got the seven year design drought, 10,000 and 70,000 for the eight year. So the last thing I'm gonna touch on is earlier runoff. And um, basically the projection is that um, uh, runoff is gonna come about three weeks earlier. So more precipitation will fall as rain, snowpack would melt earlier. So we're gonna see a shift in runoff to earlier in the season. Now, if you remember, the SFPUC gets anything above 2,400 
CFS for most of the year, but for two months, it goes up to anything above 4,000. So if you think about a three week shift in runoff, imagine everything on this graph, except for the dotted black line, shift to the left until these red lines line up with these cutoff period lines. And in the yellow here, which is a dry or red, which is a, a critically dry year, um, oops, went the wrong way. Um, basically, you have a chunk of water that moves from the time period when it belonged to the irrigation districts to the time period when it belongs to the SFPUC. So in critically dry years, they pick up water. In dry years, you see the, the SFPUC making a pretty big gain and only a small loss on this side as water moves from the 2400 cutoff into the 4000 cutoff. So what we did is we looked at all the numbers. I mean, the data is available. Those years happened and we knew when the runoff came and how much. And we just moved everything over three weeks. And we found that San Francisco, if there were a repeat of the 87 to 92 drought um, with a three week shift, they'd pick up more than a year's worth of water. So <clears throat> we presented all of this to the, the commissioners. Um, they, they're being told that they have a deficit of 84 million gallons per day if the Bay Delta plan is implemented. So that's water they'd have to make up through buying it from someone else or recycled water or desal or, or conservation. And what we showed them was, well, if you take a year off the design drought, that reduces your deficit to 59 MGD. And if you use 200, which it's been under 200 MGD for the past eight years, if you use that demand, now you're down to 23. And if you include the, um, the water you pick up as a result of earlier runoff, that brings you into a negative deficit, which is a positive. So you have a positive eight MGD. Now, you know, I, I'm not saying this is gospel, but we're saying, hey, this is what our assessment tells us. Will you comment on it? If, if you think it's wrong, will you correct it? What would you do? Nothing. They just ignore it. Um, which isn't to say we don't need to do a whole lot to conserve more water. There's still a lot we can do. Um, landscaping is really the low-hanging fruit, converting uh, thirsty lawns to climate-appropriate plants. I love native plants because they uh, provide habitat and food for native wildlife. So you're using less water that helps the salmon and the aquatic ecosystems, and you're providing food and shelter for native species. Gray water, you can do that at home now. It's legal. You can get rebates in certain places. So your um, shower water, your washing machine water, use it, get it onto those trees. Recycled water on a more municipal scale. Um, clean up the water enough for irrigation, for flushing toilets, things like that, if there's the right plumbing in buildings. And now advanced purified water, which is astronaut water. You're basically ultra purifying the water and it's drinking water quality, which uh, <clears throat> we're, we're seeing a lot of movement towards making that uh, easier to implement. Um, another really obvious thing is um, San Francisco could partner with the irrigation districts to do groundwater recharge. So in those really big water years like 2017, when there was a lot of extra water flowing through the system, um, you capture it and you have it available for dry years. The irrigation districts can't afford to do it because they charge $20 an acre foot to the farmers. We pay $2,000 an acre foot for our Tuolumne River water. So it's a lot cheaper for us to invest in infrastructure there and share in the savings. Maybe we have a groundwater water bank. And then there's a lot of opportunity for water delivery. This is a, a neighbor of our irrigation districts where they did this pressurized water system, drip irrigation, and it reduced water and energy use by 30%, but increased the crop yield by 30%. So there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, I'm going to leave you my email address if you have any questions we don't have time to get to today. But also, if you want to be on my email list, to be kept up to date on things, to know about opportunities, to comment. We really depend a lot on supporters to show up at SFPUC meetings and other important meetings and let folks know that a lot of people care 
and share good ideas with them and uh, shame them when they do the wrong thing. So Peter at Tuolumne.org, um, love to bring you into the loop. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Danny. Thanks, Peter. That was amazing per usual. Um, we're gonna go ahead and do the question and answer period. Um, if you have a question, please go down to the bottom of your screen and click the reactions. You should be able to find the raise hand function. Um, I will go ahead and call on people in order that they are raising their hands. Uh, everyone was muted upon entry, so you will see a screen that will ask you to unmute. Um, and yeah, if anyone has questions. Okay, David, go ahead. There we go. Hi, Peter. Um, so uh, our mutual friend, Didra Desjardins, um, often talks about aridification. And uh, her concern is even with the same amount of evapotranspiration, you might have more, um, I'm sorry, even with the amount, same amount of precipitation, you might not have as much runoff uh, due to evapotranspiration. And also the soils may be thirstier um, because of the drought. Um, so I, I don't know, just thinking maybe you could chat uh, with Deirdre and and see if that can be incorporated into your models. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dave, Dave. Dave, good to see you. Um, that's a good point. And the San Francisco PUC will point out that two years ago, somehow 200,000 acres feet of expected water disappeared. And it's because the soils were dry, the snow came down, and a lot of that melt was absorbed into the soil. Whereas last year, you might remember we had that big October storm. And, um, and interestingly, just that one storm provided San Francisco with enough water to last for four months. So it was really uh, a, a huge blessing. Um, but it, it saturated the soil. So then when the snow came down, the soil was already wet. And when it melted, we had a lot more runoff. So you're absolutely right. Our model isn't <clears throat> sophisticated enough to look at that. Um, and I don't think even the long-term vulnerability assessment, but um, I've spoken with Deirdre about that a little bit and, and she's right, that's something to be uh, concerned about. Also in the Bay Area, if it's you know drier or, or if it's hotter, um, people are gonna, soils are gonna dry out more and people are gonna need more irrigation, which is why uh, native plants and climate appropriate plants will be more and more important. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Doria. Hi, so um, I have a question about this. It sounds like in, in a lay person's term who is not very quick with math, that what you're advocating is a more nuanced approach, a more optimized uh, approach to water management. Why is there so much reluctance? Am I stating that correctly? And why would there be reluctance to that? Um, great question. And Doria, you forgot to mention that you're running for city council in Palo Alto. So <laughs> maybe maybe some folks here will want to follow up with you. Um, so our position is if you plan for a reasonable drought planning horizon, like something that might happen once in 5,000 years or even once in 10,000 years, and you use actual demand projections and you know, everyone knows, that, or not everyone, but um, but intellectuals who study water have seen this trend of efficiency, and it's largely been, dri been driven by cost of water, and people see that big bill, and they take advantage of rebates, and they make changes that are permanent. You know, they convert their lawn, they install the low-flow showerhead or toilet and other things. Um, so um, we're saying if we did that, then you run the numbers and you see what kind of deficit you might have and how much insurance you wanna have. And then you plan accordingly for recycled water or other alternative supplies, which are expensive. So you don't wanna over, I mean, if you, if you overbuild, maybe you put in a big de desalination facility and you don't really need it, people still have to pay for it. And so the, their, the price of their water goes up and you hit something called the death spiral where, you you don't have you you people are 
paying so much for water that they're using less and less. So you have to, the fixed costs stay the same. So you got to raise the price more, um, which can be really problematic. So the question is, why is the San Francisco PUC so entrenched? Um, I would, I think that there are three reasons, maybe four. One is that they, they feel like they got to partner with the irrigation districts that are irresponsible with water. They feel they're contractually obligated and they, they don't want to alienate them by having a different position. Two, they liked the good old days when they could sell a lot of water. Um, the rates weren't so high. People didn't complain about it. And uh, you know they make money off of selling more water. So if there's less water available, um, they got to find alternatives. They got to encourage conservation and they're selling less water. So financially, they've had been hit pretty hard the last few years because when people conserve water, that is an economic impact to them. And then the last thing is that they're stuck in old ways of thinking. They're stuck in this sacred design drought that goes back 30 years. And now there's all this new evidence, including a $743,000 climate change study that they've totally ignored. There was a workshop in August and we presented evidence from the the report and the SFPUC staff presented no evidence because it didn't support their position. And they're, they've created this house of cards. They've put out this narrative for so long now that they'd have to admit that they were wrong or even that they misled people. And we've caught them a number of times um, spreading disinformation, not just misinformation, because we know it was intentional. And now a lot of times, the, you know, we ask for, um, how'd you come up with these rationing figures? And they'll say, well, we, we can't tell you because it's a attorney-client privilege <laughs> for rationing figures. So I think it's one of those or a combination of those, but you know, it's so frustrating that for years and years, we, we make a little bit of progress. They admit to some things, they adjust the numbers a little bit, but they just can't get to the point where uh, an objective um, look at this sh shows that the Bay Delta plan is not a huge threat. Interesting. And you know, what's interesting is that people have a large sense in Palo Alto, where I live, of when they conserve more on utilities in general, they end up paying more because the cost of delivering the utilities doesn't go down. So if we use less, it goes up. And I think you kind of made that point. So I think people are kind of, I don't think people see the big picture, um, but I, I think they see the end result. And I think if we could get some more of the big picture to them in an easy way, we, you could get a lot more support. People don't think about the Tuolumne River enough, probably. Right. But anyway, yeah. I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much. I thought this was pretty informative. Well, glad you could join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doria, for that great question. Um, Julia Dowell. Hi, Peter. Uh, thanks so much for a great presentation. Um, so my question is in regard to the Bay Delta plan being updated now, and I believe you said it's supposed to be updated every three years, and it hasn't been since the 90s. Um, has there been any accountability toward like of the water board not updating their plan? And um, my follow up question is like, what do you think was the driving force for them to update the plan now? So it has to be, it's supposed to be reviewed every three years, um, but it hasn't been, but it's like, okay, well, it didn't get reviewed. Um, so in 2006, they reviewed it and they realized a lot of work needs to be done, but they kind of kicked the can down the road. Um, I see Jim Bell on this uh, Zoom, which is an honor because Jim served in the state legislature for 12 years, maybe longer. I don't know if term limits applied. Um, and I believe you're running for Valley Water Board. Is that right, Jim? Okay, you can count on my support. I believe in you. Um, so uh, Jim's colleague, Joe Simidian, um, authored the Delta Reform Act in 2009. And I'm sure Jim had a lot to do with it and probably got to vote on it. So that required an update of the, of the Bay Delta plan. And the first thing that got done was a flow criteria study. So let's look at what the San Joaquin and Sacramento rivers need. 
we're just the science. We're not going to say this is going to happen. We realize there are other um, beneficial uses. But if we're only looking at the ecosystem, and what the report said, well, 60% unimpaired flow for the San Joaquin and 75% for the Sacramento, but it acknowledged it's like, this isn't a recommendation. It's just saying that's what the, the rivers really need to survive. So um, there was a, the, the initial draft environmental document came out at the end of 2012. There were hearings, there were comments, uh, just a lot of activity. You could see, you know, the water agencies were entrenched on one side, the environmental fishing tribal groups on the other side. Felicia Marcus was the chair, and she said, you know, we're going to get sued from all directions. Uh, we got to go back and build on our case. We've got to have the tightest, best environmental document ever. Then the, uh, the drought hit and people got distracted. So it wasn't until 2016 that a new draft came out. And one change that had, they'd made was in 2012, the staff had recommended 35% unimpaired flow to start. In 2016, it was 40%. So it moved in, in the right direction. And again, we had all these hearings and you know op-eds and people weighing in. And in, in August of 2018, um, we got the Palo Alto City Council to vote unanimously to support the Bay Delta plan. And the next day, the State Water Board was voting on it and I was able to deliver that news. And everyone was like, what, a Bosque agency is supporting this plan? But um, Jerry Brown had sent a letter saying, hey, um, please don't vote on this yet. Give the voluntary agreements a little bit more time. So State Water Board held off and then they were scheduled to deliberate the day after election day when Gavin Newsom got elected governor. And this time they heard from Governor Brown and Governor Newsom saying, hey, give it a little bit more time. That's, that's what we always hear, a little bit more time. These voluntary agreements are so great. It's worth a little bit more time. So they did. And then December 12th, they asked a little bit more time, but the state water board um, under Felicia Marcus's leadership, and that, that's the key. Felicia Marcus is a leader and she did the right thing. And it was a four to one vote. Um, the, the one person who voted against it, she kind of has the agriculture seat. We didn't expect her to vote for it, but four to one was very solid. So it was adopted at that point. And then a month later, Felicia's term, on the um, on the board was up, and um, Governor Newsom did not reappoint her, and it was just terrible. I mean, this this was the best leader we ever had on the water board, and Newsom didn't reappoint her because there's a lot of pre political pressure on him, and he hasn't moved from that. He's just he's been the biggest proponent of voluntary agreements. They sound good, but um, they're just destined to fail. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but um, you got me going. Thanks, Peter. We have two more questions in the chat. Are you okay um, taking them? I know it's eight o'clock. Sure, I I'll stick around as long as people want. Awesome. Okay, so I'll read you the question from Christina in the chat. Um, is there any chance of decoupling water delivery and water use the way electricity use was decoupled in the 70s um, to remove the incentive for agencies to sell more water? Yeah, you know, that has always really appealed to me. And there's a water agency that's a member of Bosca, and they're actually the, the largest purchasers of Hetch Hetchy water called Cal Water. So they're a private company. And sometimes we put a little pressure on them and, um, and sometimes we support them. And they actually came to us uh, a few months ago and said, hey, you know, we had, this, we had this policy at the Public Utilities Commission that enabled us to decouple water and it got taken away. Would Tuolumne River Trust um, sign a support letter? Um, supporting legislation, state legislation. And uh, we did, and NRDC did, and, you know, other environmental groups, as well as water agencies. And I'm, and it, 
I think it's uh, either it got signed or it's about to get signed. I'm not sure exactly where we are in the process. So, you know, that's a great example of everyone working together. And I love it when the irrigation districts ask me to um, send a letter of support for a grant they're trying to get to, you know, clean up a polluted well or something like that. I, I love working with these groups when when we can really work towards something common. So um, there there was, was slash is legislation that will make it, I, I think it's mostly for private water agencies. And um, and that would be worth looking at and and to see who all it covers, because um, I, I don't I don't know exactly how it works and I learned a little bit in the process. But um, but you're absolutely right. If we can take the profit out of consuming more water, uh, that won't drive consuming more water. Thanks, Peter. Um, the next excuse me. The next question is from Lawrence, um, and they ask. Lothrop is raising SJ River levee heights to allow more development. They are effectively channelizing the river with very steep banks and destroying the riparian zone. Is this legal? Can it be stopped? And what will it do to salmon? I don't know about that project. Um, if you want to follow up with me um, by email and inform me a little bit, I might have some, some ideas for that, but it's foreign to me. So peter at tuolumne.org. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. Actually, David uh, is here from the Motherlode chapter and he has his hand up. So let's see. David, go ahead. Um, uh, Peter and everyone, I think the Delta Sierra group of the Motherlode chapter has been uh, already fighting uh, at least one Lathrop, Lathrop, I'm not sure how to say it, project. Um, and so there may even be some litigation in place. Uh, so I would suggest contacting the uh, Delta Sierra group, uh, Margot Prouse, P-R-A-U-S, and, and she might be able to figure out if that ties in, what you're talking about ties into something they're already resisting. Thanks, David. You bet. Yes, thank you, David. Um, are there any other questions? I see Jim in the chat said Pacheco Project. Jim, do you want to expand on that? Uh, well, I'm going to be on the board because nobody's running against me, OK? So <laughs> I'm going to be on the water board. And um, I'm not even going to, going to even be on the ballot, I guess. So that's, what they, that's the process for special districts. Uh, so I'm right now, I'm studying the water issues, and I'm um, Wondering, um, the Pacheco project is, I guess, got a. They can't put it the dam where it's supposed to be, and now they're going to push it back, or they're talking. They're they're talking about a new plan to push it back, but it goes into the state park, right? And um, is that project gone, or what's your, you know, like what's your feeling on that? And then the other question I've been working on, on looking at the governor's, he had a 19 page plan he issued about three, four weeks ago. Um, and it had like more dams and not enough recycling. Is that kind of your opinion also? That was my opinion. I mean, I thought, why not put money, you know, everybody wants to do um, water reuse, water recycling. Um, but the governor's plan had some water recycling, but mostly just funding dam projects. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've been meaning to look over the plan and I haven't gotten to it yet. So, um, but, I, but I will, and I'll follow up with you, Jim. And we have- yeah, to I told, yeah, I already told the governor, I said, you know, you're not helping anybody by putting a lot of dam projects in there because that's, our, our dam's gotta be obsolete with climate change. Well, you know, if, if you don't have water to fill a dam, it's not going to help you out too much. So dams don't create more water. Um, regarding Pacheco, um, Katya Irvin from the Sierra Club is on, and she's been following this very closely. So I want to invite her to comment if she. Uh, yeah. yeah. She's on. I see her name. 
we need to unmute her. There she is. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Yeah, I just put a couple things in the um, chat, but um, yeah, I think that Pacheco Dam, I mean, it's up to you, Jim, and the board of directors to make the decision. So far, the board has been hanging on and wanting to keep that on the books. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, they got the money, they got the 500 million from the Prop 1 um, yeah. storage investment program. And, you know, just kind of like with SFPC and their pride about not wanting to say they're wrong <clears throat> about their drought, um, you know, their um, design drought. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with that. Um, but it's just pointing to, for Pacheco in particular, there's just been so many problems um, with, um, you know, just the technical aspects of it um, and um, the cost going up. So I think it's gonna be difficult for the, for Valley Water to eventually, I think you guys will have to just say, Let's just not do this because it's not it doesn't, push, the cost uh, benefit doesn't. Yeah, does it? Sorry, push the, the cost reservoir, benefit doesn't work out. Yeah, does it push the reservoir into the state park? The, the well, yes, that's the plan right now. Is what yeah. they're proposing is for it to go a little bit into the park, and there's you know there are a lot of park advocates who are pretty up in arms about that, but. Okay. From what from what Valley Water says, Valley Water is saying that um, that they're working with parks and they're gonna they're gonna provide other benefits to mitigate. So that part is it's unclear about how much of an issue that's going going to be. Yeah. I like to connect Pacheco State Park with Henry Coe State Park by acquiring more properties so that two parks are connected with one another. That would make, make a massive, huge state park. Uh, you know, so the parks would come right to the Highway 152 and there'd be like a whole state park complex right there. That'd be, um, that was always my dream. I'm, I don't think you'll find too many environmentalists who would fight you on that because one of our biggest issues with the reservoir is that it will impede um, animal movement. Yeah, right. And uh, yeah. migration, yeah. And then they, they kind of, um, originally, like I'm looking at history, kind of the Santa Clara Valley, they originally were talking about building um, more recycled water, purified treatment. And then they had like a, a fight with the city of San Jose water treatment plant and they weren't able to conclude some kind of an agreement. And that's been in a, in a stall pattern for the last eight years, uh, political kind of problems. And uh, so then that's when Pacheco started becoming more and more of an option because they couldn't do the recycled so I, I'm kind of looking at whether or not recycled water, is, is there any environmental issues that we have to be aware of on that? Uh, that was one question I had for Peter, if he's still- Well, you know, I would it. just say we have to be you know, aware of energy use and how you dispose yeah. of uh, the material that comes out. So not deal breakers. I'm, I think recycled water um, makes more sense than desalination. Um, there's some brackish desalination that uh, makes better sense than salt water. It makes brine. It makes a brine, doesn't right. it? They have to do something with that. Yeah. So you have similar issues with with brine type stuff in the in the wastewater. Um, Jim, it's going to be great to have you on the the board. And hey, thank you, everybody. Keep in touch. We're expecting you to clean things up there, and uh, it, it must be nice to be able to scare off all your opposition, so you don't have to mount a an expensive campaign. It's the area I've represented for 30 years. So yeah. everybody in there knows me. So it's kind of like my own town. Well, thanks for your good work. Yeah. Yes, thank you. you. 
Um, David. That might have been a hand from before. Oh, no, I'm still talking. Sorry, Peter. I was just going to say to Jim, in addition to the well-known Henry Coast State Park issue, you're also drowning uh, part of the Romero Ranch a Nature Conservancy Conservation Easement. And you're also drowning, I think it's coyote, uh, help me folks, Fish and Wildlife Preserve, something like that. Um, it's a state preserve that's, and uh, no one's standing up for those either, but they're also gonna be drowned with the Pacheco expansion. Thanks, David. Uh, Charming. Hi, everyone. Uh, Charming England. I chair the Water Committee for Sierra Club, California. So I actually just wanted to address uh, the comments made on recycled water. Uh, first off, if anyone, if people don't know that um, a legislation for direct portable reuse, which means the water that you can drink immediately. It doesn't have to be, it's not augmented. It doesn't have to be put into the ground or mixed. Um, legislation for that is actually due at the end of next year for California. So it's actually much closer than a lot of you know, and we're hoping that they will not um, have an extension on that. Um, also, the byproduct actually, the byproducts are usually used with the sludge, with the sludge and, um, and used to convert to energy, to offput some of the energy use that they use with the technology with reverse osmosis or RO, like we call it. So the technology is actually there and it's a lot less energy intensive than ocean desalination. So I just wanted to make that quick comment. Well, and, and Jim, you know, they've got an, um, an anaerobic digester there at, at Zanker Road facility, which isn't too far from the wastewater treatment plant. That, you know, you, you, the, the waste product, um, send it over there and generate biogas, maybe make biochar from it. Um, there's real opportunity. We're looking into some of those things in Palo Alto too. One other thing, uh, Jim, that you might or might not know, um, what, what motivated the early recycled water projects in San Jose is that EPA said, you guys are dumping too much fresh water, too much fresh wastewater into the South Bay and there's not enough circulation there. It's affecting the salinity balance. So they capped how much water was allowed to be released. And it's like, okay, well, what do we do with it? I guess we're gonna have to recycle it. And it turns out that um, that's gonna be, you know, it puts um, Santa Clara County way ahead of everyone else because we're probably going to see legislation or regulation um, reducing the amount of wastewater released into the bay because of, of fish kills like that one a couple of weeks ago, the algae bloom. And it's, you know, it's nitrogen and phosphorus from wastewater, water getting warm, and you have these fish kills. And so it's a matter of time before someone steps in and says, you know what, we're going to cap how much you can put in there and everyone's going to have to start recycling water. Um, and San Jose and Santa Clara Valley Water District are ahead of the game. Thanks, Peter. If there are any other questions, um, please go ahead and raise your hands or ask them in the chat. Um, but otherwise, we can go ahead and wrap up. I don't see any lasting hands. Oh, I do see one more. David. David, I think you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yeah, I still can't hear you, David, unfortunately. It doesn't look like you're muted though. Um, would you like to put your question in the chat? I'll give David a second. Okay, awesome. Thank you, David. Um, and if that's it, looks like we are all wrapped up. Peter, thank you again so much. Thank you. Well, I, I think I have my mic now. Oh, 
Yes, we can hear you. Well, thank you. Uh, David Wofford here. And I'm, uh, I, I was late, but I wanted to come because I really wanted to hear uh, Peter's presentation. I've been on his mailing list for some time and trying from Oakland to uh, track uh, what's happening. But uh, at, at the, it was, I didn't have anything to say, but as the meeting was ending there, you mentioned the algae blow. And I'm the co-chair of the Rotary Nature Center Friends at Lake Merritt. So I wanted to share that information with Katie Noonan. And we produce a program called Lakeside Chat uh, each month where we feature uh, scientists and naturalists who talk about the biology and science of Lake Merritt. And the, uh, Damon Teague was our last speaker, and he did speak about the uh, recent algae bloom in the San Francisco Bay and where it came from and where it's going and what its lasting impact may or may not be. Um, and fortunately, I was trying to quickly see if I could find, we don't have, we just did it a couple of weeks ago, so we don't have the link up yet. But if anyone wanted to uh, look us up at the Rotary Nature Center Friends, uh, it's a great program. And then again, thank everybody, uh, both uh, you, Peter, for your uh, work and the wonderful new speaker that I met tonight. I'm so happy to hear all of you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, David. And, and if you think of it, maybe you um, can send me an email with a link to the program and, um, and we can kind of follow up on that. I can absolutely do that. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, David, for being here tonight. Um, and I do want to just quickly plug that next month we will be having a webinar um, with a presenter from Baykeeper, San Francisco Baykeeper, who will also be talking about the algal bloom um, and kind of dispelling a lot of that information, um, as well as touching on the wastewater facilities and their kind of role on that. Um, and with that, I hope everyone has a great night. Um, I put both mine and Peter's email in the chat. So please feel free to reach out to either of us if you have any questions. Uh, and yeah, have a great night. Thanks so much for being here. Good to see you Thank all. You. Thanks for hanging in there. Thanks again, Peter. That was great. Thanks, Danny.